This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. Here's what's making news right now. Deadly car accident, the body of a young man student is found. We cannot afford to continue as usual. A new report forecasts a major population plummet. Hitting where it hurts. It's gonna cost me a $1,000 a year in disposable income. The death of a child is a living nightmare for a parent. And that is what the family of 18-year-old Allison Smith is dealing with tonight. Smith was last seen around 1 a.m. on Tuesday at Memorial University in St. John's. She was due in Clarenville the very next morning for an appointment, but she didn't make it. On Wednesday, the RNC released a missing persons report. Today, police put out this photo of her car, a 2012 gray four-door Hyundai Elantra. This afternoon, the car was found off the Trans-Canada, just west of St. John's. And that's where Here Now's Ariana Kelland is live this evening. So, Ariana, what have you learned since you arrived? Well, Debbie, I'm about 15 kilometers west of St. John's right now, just before the Foxtrap Way scales. And right behind me is where the body of Allison Smith was recovered just hours ago. Now, earlier today, a member of the RNC from the Mount Pearl Detachment was doing checks along the TCH for Smith. This was in addition to checks done earlier in the day by the RCMP and the RNC when she came across tracks into the grass just before a guardrail that those tracks went right over an embankment with a drop of about 20 to 25 feet. All afternoon, first responders, police and tow truck operators worked to recover Smith's body and to recover her vehicle that was down over that embankment. Now we do know we don't know how the collision happened. We know that it happened just 20 feet before the guardrail. We don't know when the collision happened. We know that Allison Smith was last seen around 1 a.m. at Munn leaving a party and that she was supposed to be in Clarenville for 9 a.m. that same morning. So we don't know when the collision happened. We do know that this is a particularly dangerous spot. I'm told that in the last three, two years rather, there have been three separate separate accidents where vehicles have gone over that embankment. Two years ago, a man, Sheldon Quinton, on his way to work, veered off the road and his truck plunged off the highway. You couldn't see his truck from the highway, which was the case with Allison Smith's car today. In that case, Sheldon Quinton did pass away and his friends had to make that gruesome discovery. In the other case, the people did survive, but I am told that where Allison Smith's car did land today was right next to the memorial for Sheldon Quinton. Reporting live from the TCH, I'm Arianna Kelland. The sentencing of two men who pleaded guilty to killing a man in Conception Bay South has been delayed. He made a brief appearance today. They have both pleaded guilty to manslaughter in the death of 25-year-old Stephen Miller. The prosecution and defense want the pair to be sent to prison for seven and a half years. The judge told a packed courtroom today that he was holding off on sentencing them. Details of the case are covered under a publication ban since another person charged in Miller's killing could still face first-degree murder trial. That man, Paul Connolly, is set to appear in court later this month. Charges have been dismissed against Southern Construction more than two years after an employee fell to his death in Trapassi. C.J. Curtis was on the roof of the building in June 2015 when he fell more than six meters through a skylight and onto a concrete floor. A judge has ruled there's not enough evidence to prove the case, in part because the RCMP didn't take photographs or secure the scene, and health and safety officials took too long to get to the site to investigate. Well, doctors want to be paid the way they've always been in order to give you a flu shot. So they're calling on government to reverse a decision it made last year that prevents them from setting up flu shot clinics. Doctors say this will result in more people getting sick and ultimately cost the health care system more. But the province doesn't see it that way. Here now's Mark Quinn reports. Doctors in this province say they can see no good reason to stop paying them $17 each time they give a patient a flu shot. 
The medical association that represents them says neither patients nor taxpayers will be served by this decision. This decision was made to save money, but it may actually affect the health and lives of our patients and increase costs for taxpayers. Physicians gave about 50% of all flu shots in this province last year. They fear the government's decision will mean as many as 20,000 people won't get shots this year. And they believe some of those people will get the flu and end up in hospital. Bad for them and more expensive for the health care system. The NDP is also criticizing the government. This is unconscionable of this government. Say you're wrong, change the decision, bring back good health to this province. But the government is defending the move. The health minister says it's not about money. He says it's about allowing highly skilled doctors to focus on complex care that only they can give. The aim of this change was to free up those physicians so that if they want to work an extra Saturday morning or they have time, it's spent on those problems that no one else can deal with. Uh, the flu shot issue can be managed uh, in a different way. Doctors and public health clinics will still provide flu shots with no out-of-pocket charge to patients. But now, if a doctor gives a patient a flu shot, it will have to be as part of a regular checkup. And the bill for that visit? $32. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. We're aging faster than any other province with more deaths than births. Young people are leaving while the remaining population is shifting to urban centres. None of this comes as a surprise, but a new study released today paints a clearer picture of what our reality might look like in a couple of decades. Here now is Terry Roberts has that story. Community leader, uh, I'll go, uh, I will not go down without fighting. Determined optimism from a small town leader, but the harsh reality small town Newfoundland and Labrador continues to empty out, while places like St. John's, swelling. Munns Harris Centre has the numbers and they're not pretty. Our population will most likely shrink by 40,000 over the next 20 years. Average age will increase to 48 from 43. Not a winning recipe for the future, especially if you live in rural areas. The top of the Northern Peninsula, from River of Ponds to Roddickton will lose almost half its population in 20 years. We can't continue as before. There are fewer people, there are fewer people going to be in the labour force, there's less income coming into the province from taxes and so on and so forth. The reverse is true here on the Northeast Avalon. Strong, steady growth. A sobering outlook, but the group that advocates for municipalities is trying to put on a brave face. By looking at this from outside, you know, looking, looking in, I, I would be devastated. I would say, oh my God, what are we going to do over the next 20 years? You know, but you, you got to be optimistic. Can anything be done to stem the tide? Words like innovation, regionalization are being used, but it's no easy challenge. The situation does not uh, represent a, an optimistic picture. But in terms of how we address the situation, I think there's cause for optimism, still. So I'm, I'm not writing the place off. But even the most optimistic agree that this province will look a lot different in 2036. Sure, still block streets here in the city, but fewer communities, fewer people, a much older population. The only real solutions, a massive influx of new immigrants and perhaps another baby boom. A tall order indeed. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the first candidate has come forward and in the expected by-election in Bonavista Buren Trinity. Churance Rogers says he will seek the Liberal nomination. The former president of municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador says his goal is to provide strong representation in Ottawa. Judy Foote is expected to step down this month after almost 10 years as the MP for the riding. She resigned from Cabinet last month. Well, we will be seeing a lot of souped-up cars on the east coast of the province in coming days. The annual Targa competition is set to begin. Yeah, drivers from around the world arrive this time of year to take part in a race that will see their vehicles travel the roads and highways of the Avalon, Bonavista and Buren peninsulas. And tonight, Ryan is getting an up-close and personal look at the Targa competition. He's one of the drivers tonight. Ryan, how did you swing that? <laughs> 
Well, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure Kirk uh, is going to let me behind the wheel. Uh, we got to keep this thing safe. Uh, but uh, Kirk Jones, uh, first of all, welcome to Newfoundland. Thank you, Ryan. I'm glad to be here. Uh, you came a long way uh, just for this. Why, why all the way to Newfoundland? For Targa, Targa Tasmania. It's only one of three Targas in the world, and I'm here to run it. And one, as we look at your car here, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what an endurance test this is going to be for your vehicle? Uh, it's going to be a bit of an endurance test. It's going to be 1,600 kilometers of uh, 400 kilometers of closed stages. Um, it's going to be tough on the car because I've noticed since I've got here that even my tow vehicles had struggles with those potholes. But anyways. <laughs> we uh, got a few potholes here. You, yeah. you seem to have the corner of the market on potholes, but wow. Um, but anyways, it's, uh, it's a fully prepared car. It's, uh, it's a Volkswagen Golf R. Uh, it's 2016, and uh, it's ready to roll for Targa. Let's get in. Have a look at Alrighty. it. All yeah, righty. Now, this is going to be interesting. We did. I did already try and get in, uh, but uh, for somebody uh, that's 6'3", this uh, car is a little tough to squeeze into, so bear with me here. I'm going to put the, uh, the phone up here like this. Now, the microphone in here, and Kirk did yep. give me some instructions. This. Very straightforward. I sit in. Now that belt popped down on me again here. Okay. Okay. So now we're in the car. In the car. And these 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 seats, they aren't exactly like my Honda Civic. No, they're designed. They're uh, they're especially designed for racing and to withstand uh, their SFA rated for for crashes and so forth. And if you look around also, you'll see the full-blown roll cage in here. It's a SCCA approved uh, six-point roll cage. You see the crossbar and the, the communications in the back there mounted. And got the fire extinguishers, one at your feet here and one in the back as well. Now, uh, now what, uh, how long did it take to get this car ready? <laughs> 245 days. I spoke to Darren at uh, Targa, Newfoundland, and uh, I put my entry fee in and it started uh, October 24th. Wow. That's when it started. And the car was parked in the garage, and we've worked on it uh, for basically the, the over the whole winter, and just preparing it all summer. Are you ready for the conditions? Because we're going to get some rain. We're going to get a lot of rain uh, beginning this weekend. Monday's going to be a soaker. Are you ready for that? I live for the rain. I've been hoping for the rain guards. So you just put you just predict rain all week because rain is the great equalizer, and this little car loves the rain. That's interesting because yeah, like you said, there are cars that are, have a lot more horsepower than this one. But uh, you, you so you want the rain? Absolutely. Levels all, we, all, all, all levels of playing field. It's all wheel drive, and it it really runs great in the rain. It loves the cool. The engine really loves the cool damp air. Now, uh, the name of the team? No brainer racing. And uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, it's uh, it's it come out of um, uh, a, a group of a group of guys at work that we wanted to come up with a racing team name that was sort of um, mental health sort of related, but not in, in a very positive way and, and a fun way. Um, and we it, it just sort of came to us like it's a no brainer, right? It's uh, you know mental health today. It's a no brainer, right? So we created the uh, the graphics, and uh, we've got a couple of uh, uh, other graphics for the actual charity itself that we're racing for as well. So. So uh, that'll be your inspiration over the next week? Uh, my daughter's my inspiration. My family's really my inspiration. But yes, uh, racing for mental health is really what... Uh, and, and you know, we're, we're trying to raise funds. And if we raise $10, that's great. Uh, really what this is really all about is just promoting the fact that Pete, there's, you need to get help. There's, there's a system out there. And to talk about it. It's really just creating awareness. It's really what it's all about when it comes down to it. Perfect. Well... Can we take her for a spin? Absolutely. All right. So we're going to uh, get buckled up here. you got to get buckled up. <laughs> and uh, head out on the road. And after, right after the break, we're going to talk about that uh, wet-looking forecast, especially for eastern Newfoundland, uh, over the next couple of days. So we'll, we'll see you in just a minute. The companies hit especially hard by that big gas increase. Coming up later on here now, we'll look under the hood of this troubled industry. And still to come, all eyes are on the state of Florida as it prepares for the possibility that the worst hurricane on record could soon hit land.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Yesterday, there were long lineups for gas, and some stations in the province even ran out of fuel as people tried to beat today's 13 cent price hike. It's especially painful for one group of people that's already hurting taxi drivers. Here now is Anthony Germain takes you on a spin now with one of the St. John's cabbies he started 37 years ago. Hey, Joe, how's it going? Not bad, Anthony. How are you? Very good. Let's go for a ride. Well, take me out to the mall there. Not the Avalon Mall, but another mall. All right. Uh, pretty big, 14 cents, almost 14 cents gas increase last night. That's almost depressing, isn't it? Almost? Almost depressing, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's, insurance is one thing, gas is another, right. maintenance is another. I mean, it's just we're getting hit we'll, every way around. We'll get to those, uh, those other costs you guys have to bear right now, but what do you make? 14 cents, what does that mean? to you in the taxi industry? That means 14 cents, if that stays at 14 cents for an extended period of time, say 12, I mean, it probably won't, but I mean, there's other factors too. It's gonna cost me a $1,000 a year in disposable income. Well, why can't you just raise the raise the taxi for? I mean, I can't do that. City Hall and the owners of the company's got to get there and do that. I mean, that's the only way we're gonna get our money back. It goes up and it goes down, and then the government puts money on, or taxes on the uh, on the gas again, and every time we, we take a hit, but like, we, we have no way of recouping it unless we get a, an increase in our meters. Is this just the sort of latest kick in the teeth for people who drive taxis? Well, I mean, that's what? one thing. Insurance is the other thing. Insurance? Sure. My insurance has quadrupled from $1,321 to close to $6,000 when I, uh, when, if and when, if or when, I actually renew it in November. I went from $1,321 to almost $6,000 and I don't even have a traffic ticket. And on top of that, government put on their, their, uh, their taxes on top of it too besides that. So they're, they're taxing our gas, they're taxing our insurance, they're taxing everything. You said if, you're thinking maybe... Oh, I may be forced to give it up, I'll probably have to go drive for somebody else. I can't, it's, it's difficult for me to justify 6,000, from $1,321 to $6,000 in the span of only a couple of years. Right. And we have no say in it because Facility Association has a monopoly. If they say we gotta pay $10,000, we pay $10,000 or we give it up. And close to 50 to 100 brokers after giving it up in the last year, and gone to work for somebody else who can afford to pay the insurance. So you got the, the insurance, you got this gas increase. You've also got, you pay for taxi stands, something that people don't well, know. No, right? we, we had to pay our rent, taxi rent, every week in the hundreds of dollars. And if we make no money, we still have to pay it. That's just the way it works. So what would it take to actually increase uh, increase the actual taxi fare? Although, would people still use taxis? Yeah, they tell you that they won't. I mean, it's the same thing with people who said, but if the price of gas goes up, they're not gonna drive anymore. Yeah. That's horse manure. Of course, you, the first few days everybody's complaining about it, and then they'll just continue on as if it never happened. What about the number of cars on the roads? We have 364 taxis in St. John's, 364 for a population of about 100,000. That's deplorable. They need to take at least 100 taxis off the road, retire the licenses. And the only way they can do that is for somebody at City Hall to speak to all the owners or the uh, the operators of those licenses. Right. And you buy them back and take the cars off the road so we can all make a decent living. But I mean, it's difficult to do. So you've got all of these issues. I, I should point out that, uh, you know, you know a lot. You've written this book, well, St. John's Taxi Chronicles. Yeah. Do you think people, and there's lots of scary stories in this book too, some funny ones, but a couple. Do you, do you think people understand how difficult it is to be a taxi they driver? They have no idea. The only way they can do it is sit in the taxi for 10 to 12 hours a day for seven days a week for an extended period of time over a span of months and then come back and say, oh yeah, that was easy. It's yeah. not easy. Arrogant people, uh, people spitting at you, people who want to beat the face off you. I mean, it's the hiking gas, it's the hiking insurance, dealing with people, people get in who don't want to pay you what's on the meter, yeah. get out of your taxi and take off. Other people who complain about a quarter and they spend a half an hour trying to waste your time complaining about a quarter yeah. and you're telling them to get out of the taxi and not to worry about it. Somebody within the taxi industry has got to go approach City Hall and say, listen here, like we put up with enough of this and we're absorbing too much. It's time to put the meters up. All right, well, I'll pay you an invoice. No sweat. Thanks a lot, Joe. Good luck. Only a hundred bucks, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a deal. All right, good luck. All right, thanks, Anthony. All right, we are in a Targa car. This is uh, Kirk Jones, and uh, he's taking me for a little spin. Uh, Kirk, how excited are you for the next week? Uh, it's 25 years in the making, so there's a little bit of excitement here. And uh, if there's one word that you could you could say about the next week, is it excitement? Is it anticipation? Is it? It's going to be epic. I like it. One word. I like it. Uh, safe to say this is the first time a weather forecast has ever been done from a Targa car. And uh, 
Keith, uh, sorry, Kirk wants some uh, some weather, some rain. And he's gonna get some because uh, I deliver. <laughs> Yeah, at least for you. Everybody else doesn't. Nobody else wants rain. Uh, have a look at uh, highs today. It was a beautiful day. It still is. Uh, temperatures right now, uh, 26 degrees across uh, uh, was the high across St. John's. We also did get to uh, 26, 27 degrees uh, through parts of central Newfoundland. A little cooler with that rain rolling into Labrador 13, the high in Labrador City, and it was uh, 15 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Uh, taking a look at uh, current temperatures, it's still very, very warm. Uh, right now, 24. Just at 9 to 11 degrees across northern Labrador uh, to the west. And Humidex values on the island, yeah, it's been a little sticky. Some folks uh, certainly not liking how uh, sticky it's been, including Kirk, who's wearing this uh, fireproof suit. Uh, 32 is what it feels like uh, with the Humidex and Gander and still in St. John's. Satellite radar picture uh, does show that we've got this system that's been rolling in uh, through the day today. Uh, west Coast, Northern Peninsula, and Labrador have been bearing the brunt of this rain fall through the day uh i keep going straight kirk you're doing great buddy you're doing you're, you're, you're yeah great you're, navigating you're nice uh now as we back things out look at the stream of moisture coming in from the south all the way back down to the tropics so we've got a, a lot of rain that's coming in from the right out of the gulf of mexico and that is going to continue to rain itself out over newfoundland over the next couple of days satellite uh i believe we have the uh, rainfall warnings in effect here uh, to show you uh, where we have uh, yeah, rainfall warnings for the southwest coast uh, right now uh, with uh, special weather statements in effect for the west coast. Also rainfall warnings in effect for Churchill Valley, Churchill Falls and the north coast of, Newf of uh, Labrador. I would expect that we're going to be seeing some rainfall warnings issued for eastern Newfoundland for this weekend. Not in place just yet, but here's how it plays out. Watch your future tracker. The rain uh, will be at times heavy tonight across Labrador. That'll taper to some showers. It's rain at times heavy across western Newfoundland, pushing into central for tomorrow morning. At times heavy through the morning. St. John's some scattered showers through the day tomorrow, uh, including in the morning but the best chance is certainly tomorrow afternoon as we roll through. Uh, there are your morning temperatures starting near 20 across the island. We're going to be very sticky from start to finish in St. John's, sticky in the morning uh, for central and western Newfoundland, but as we roll throughout the day, watch that front. It'll move from west to east, and we're really going to see the humidity dropping off. Uh, as that front moves eastward, we see some gradual clearing western Newfoundland central. You'll notice a real drop in the humidity for you folks. Uh, not really dropping off the humidity until tomorrow night here across the Avalon. Listen to that engine purr. Now as we uh, take a look at uh, for tomorrow afternoon uh, in St. John's, we'll likely get up to around 23, 24 degrees, uh, looking at a nice one. Uh, temperature wise, not so much clouds and showers, and we will continue to stay mild into the evening, but yeah, still a pretty good chance of some uh, showers tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening into the overnight. There's your forecast highs for tomorrow, and have another look. You can see where we're going to be at 24 in the metro region, and I think central Newfoundland topping out 22, 23 degrees, but again, a big drop in humidity for you folks into the afternoon with shower chances moving out from west to east. Western Newfoundland uh, just basically steady from where you start in the morning to the afternoon, 18, 19 degrees. Labrador scattered showers, temperatures in the 12 to 13 degree range. Now, uh, again, driving in the car right now, we're actually going to... Uh, Book it over to uh, to uh, CBC. Actually, I'll show you. How about our little uh, view here? We're on the parkway. Uh, just so everyone knows at home, we are driving within the uh, rules of the road, the speed limit, Absolutely. And which is important. Now, what's the speed limit when you're in the race this week? 200 kilometers an hour. Seriously? 200 kilometers an hour. Now, we won't be going 200 right now, which is good for me because uh, I haven't don't have my brown pants on. <laughs> But, no, uh, uh, that's uh, it's crazy. And how many times do you think in the race that you'll actually get up to 200? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's a thousand, there's a thousand turns or more in the in the in it. And uh, how many times we're going to get up to 200? I have no idea. But uh, hopefully, as much as we can. I love this line from you. You'll do turns one time. No. Well, up next, a former election and a ruling from the Newfoundland and Labrador Supreme Court that could change the future and technically changes the past when it comes to this election. The details up next.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A Supreme Court judge in this province has struck down one of the ways used to vote in provincial elections. The case started in 2011 after Clyde Jackman narrowly beat Julie Mitchell in Buren Placentia West. It was special ballots that secured enough votes for him to win. Mitchell challenged the ballots because people can vote weeks before the election has even started and before the candidates are in place. She argued that makes it unconstitutional and the Supreme Court agreed. I reached Mitchell in Marystown for her reaction. Well, I always had an issue with the special ballot. I, I myself did not think it gave everybody the right opportunity to vote uh, an informed vote and neither did it give potential candidates a good opportunity to have the opportunity to uh, to run and run fairly. In what way? What do you think the unfair advantage was in this? Uh, well, the unfair advantage is that four weeks before uh, an election writ, writ was dropped, uh, any person could go in, anyone on the voters list could go in and cast a ballot. There might not have even been a declared candidate for that particular party or any particular party. Um, and the other part as well would be independent candidates. Where would they fit into the equation? So you just go in and mark a, a ballot for Liberal NDP PC. Uh, it wasn't even a ballot, it was a blank piece of paper. And, uh, and, and, you know, that's not an informed vote, in my opinion, because all candidates did not have the opportunity to lay their platform out there before the writ was dropped. So without those special ballots, you would have won in that district. How does that feel six years later? Uh, it doesn't feel any different today than it felt back in 2011. I knew then that I had won because, uh, after all, all candidates do get uh, a printout of uh, what they've won and what they didn't. I knew I won Election Day. I knew I won the uh, advance poll. So it was only the special ballot that was the deciding factor at that time. So, you know, I was disappointed on that election night, and there's no question about that because, as any candidate will tell you, you put in a lot, darn lot of hard work in any election campaign. But um, I just picked up the pieces the next morning and went back to my job and went back to my regular life. And uh, that's been the way it has been for the last six years. Uh, I'm very pleased with yesterday's, uh, with yesterday's decision by the Supreme Court uh, because I think it gives uh, – it, it, it serves justice to potential candidates and the electorate in general. Do you ever think, though, what would have happened if you'd actually won? You'd then been an MHA, you'd gotten to serve that four years. The NDP caucus would have been bigger, might have even formed the official opposition. It, it leads you sort of down an interesting path of the one little oh, change yeah, and everything that might have changed. Absolutely. There's, you know, it could have changed the whole political landscape in this province if that had happened. And, uh, and I'm, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm certain my life certainly would have been different than it is right now. Uh, you know, I, not that it would have been any better, but it certainly would have been different. Well, thank you very much for uh, sharing your thoughts with me today. I appreciate it. Not a problem, Peter. Thank you. So what's the government going to do? Well, the justice minister says he didn't like the way special ballots worked, so now it's going to be up to the legislature to fix it before an election. It's been recognized in other courts that you need to have the means to cast your vote by a proxy. That being said, the provision that was here in this province was probably a bit too far on the other end of the spectrum. There's got to be a middle ground that it respects that right for a person to cast their vote, but at the same time isn't unconstitutional. So that's what we're going to put our mind to now. Here, the 16th race of Targa Newfoundland. And uh, yeah, I'm getting the, uh, I've got quite the gig tonight. So coming up, we're going to talk more about Target Newfoundland. And of course, I'll have your weather forecast details. You want rain, you're going to get rain, Kirk. We'll talk about that coming up.
Most of us have never experienced a true hurricane until Igor hit us, but imagine having been through two and staring down a third. That's where Julia Butler Tarnu finds herself tonight. She is a Salvation Army captain from this province who is living and working in Sanford, Florida, near Orlando. And that side of the Florida coastline is bracing for Hurricane Irma, which has caused major destruction in the Caribbean already. Now we've reached Julia at the Salvation Army offices in Sanford. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Debbie. It's a pleasure to be here. Now you were in this province for Igor, and this time last year you were in Fort Lauderdale when Matthew hit. So what went through your mind when you heard you were going to be facing this monster storm called Irma? Well, um, Last year, as I was in Fort Lauderdale and we were preparing, um, thankfully, um, the intensity of the storm didn't hit us as it was intended. Um, so when I um, heard of Irma uh, and uh, the potential threat that it would pose to us here, uh, it gives you a sense of uneasiness. I'm used to snowstorms, <laughs> uh, but hurricanes is still something that I'm... Um, um, a little bit unfamiliar with, so it, it gives a bit of a, an unsettled feeling for sure. And what is the latest? Are they saying that uh, they think Irma is going to hit where you are? Uh, currently, uh, it's projected to be Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon, um, just before um, your call. Uh, we had a conference call with uh, the Salvation Army all across Florida and um, in Fort Lauderdale, where uh, we just moved from. Um, there are certain parts of that area that are under evacuation orders right now. Mm. Um, so it's already happening there, um, the evacuation, and it's projected to hit here about Sunday. And what are people doing where you are to prepare? People are uh, trying to secure the supplies that they would need. Water and bread um, are pretty much nowhere to be seen in stores now unless you can get there early in the mornings. Um, so uh, people are preparing um, for food supplies, dry goods, uh, generators. Um, they're preparing themselves for the worst, preparing their houses, uh, boarding up windows and things of that nature. There's an urgency there amongst people to just get ever what, whatever they can. Absolutely. Um, and within the past two days, both my husband and I and uh, members of our staff have been uh, going and we have been successful in securing uh, some things and of course we have um, uh, supplies on hand already but even this morning um, at a Sam's Club uh, we were there uh, at 6.30 this morning in line and uh, the, there were police cars directing traffic um, so we managed to get some water but um, a gentleman came to me and he said where can I get water and I told him but everything was gone within 30 minutes. What else is uh, the Salvation Army doing to prepare to help people? Right now, we have um, 32 canteens or mobile kitchens that are um, ready, are on standby. Um, there are um, 250,000 meals that can be ready to be deployed from um, a divisional perspective, from the Florida division. Um, and already, especially in South Florida, Miami, um, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, uh, tractor trailer loads of water and food have already been shipped there. Uh, because, um, of course, Irma will be hitting that portion of the state first. Um, locally, uh, we're preparing, even as we speak, um, to be able to prepare and serve 1,500 meals locally. Well, just as a final question to you, Julia, take off your official hat and speak to me as a family person. What are you doing to make sure that you guys are going to be okay? I was just in Newfoundland um, last week, uh, just returned, and my parents are here visiting with me. Um, so my husband, my parents, and even our little dog, uh, we're trying to do all that we can to make sure we have enough food on hand um, in case of power outages, we, we have enough food to, to last us for three days. Uh, we're also, um, not only our own family, but even our church family, we're connecting with the elderly and uh, those who may have other limitations, making sure that they're okay. So um, in our shopping and our uh, gathering of supplies for our organization, we're also uh, taking the time to make sure we have everything that we need. And uh, thankfully, if evacuation is needed, we have secured those places where we would go 
in case that happens, but praying really hard that it doesn't come to that. And it must be a little unnerving, is it? Absolutely, it is unnerving. And uh, you hear so much of people saying, well, it may not happen. It might not be as bad as they predict, but also realizing that uh, people have been stuck in the situation where uh, with that type of thinking, they've been caught in a very bad situation. So we're wanting to make sure that we're prepared, that our people are prepared, and uh, we're ready to do whatever is necessary to help our community. Captain uh, Julia butler Tarnu, thank you so much for speaking with us, and uh, I hope things go very well for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. All right, time uh, to uh, take a look at the weather, and of course, talking about hurricanes and talking about Irma, which continues to be a major, major hurricane. Uh, have a look, uh, still a category five storm. This thing is massive. Uh, it, it, hard to believe it's been a category five for this long. Uh, still looking at gusts near 350 kilometers per hour uh, as it continues to do damage in the Caribbean. Uh, look at the future track here in terms of the National Hurricane Center track. It from a cat five will continue to be a category five likely through tomorrow into the weekend weakening. And there's the latest National Hurricane Center track, which brings it into southern Florida. Uh, somewhere in the Miami region is looking likely at this point and then up to the north may come back out over water, may stay right over the Florida Peninsula, then up into the southeastern parts of the U.S. with just a soaking, soaking rain. Uh, again, forecast models, all these different lines are different model ideas. So you may think, well, that actually looks like pretty good agreement, but uh, a slight deviance to the east or west will be a, a big, big difference in terms of what they see in Florida. But either way, major impacts expected there. States of emergency are still in place for Florida because of Irma moving in this weekend. Closer to home, and in fact, we'll take a look at the weather setup. There's Irma, there's Jose, and there's Katia, and those three storms brewing to the south, none expected to have any major impact on us at this point. We are watching, though, this tropical feed of moisture coming in through the weekend, which is going to be our big rain setup. Here's how it plays out. Future Tracker, uh, actually first rainfall warnings, there's where they are in effect right now. Labrador and western, southwestern Newfoundland expected, uh, I'm expecting that rainfall warning to be expanded uh, to eastern Newfoundland for the weekend, uh, given the fact that we're going to be seeing some heavier rains, if not rainfall warnings, then special weather statements uh, because of how much rain is on the way. And we'll show you how much in just a second. Future Tracker tonight shows that heavy rain over Labrador. That will ease to some scattered showers as we move into tomorrow morning. Watch your timeline here. As we get to tomorrow morning, the best chance of some rain at times heavy will be over central Newfoundland and over Labrador, tapering to scattered showers through the day across the big land. Heaviest rains move eastward and across the Avalon through the afternoon. I think we'll, could, we could certainly see some breaks uh, for Friday night in through Saturday at times, but periods of rain are on the menu. Uh, right through the weekend. Here's uh, there's your Friday temperatures. Again, muggy in the east again tomorrow as well as central, but humidity dropping off for central Newfoundland and just eight degrees along the north coast of Labrador, low teens in the south. Saturday's forecast, and we'll walk you through your timeline here. Friday night, that chance of periods of rain continues across the Avalon. You can see this latest forecast model keeping some of those rains offshore at times. Some uh, at other times of the day, I think they will clip in, but I don't think it's going to be just a straight up nonstop rain from Friday through Sunday. I think we will see some breaks in there, but certainly some rain at times heavy, but it's mainly the Avalon that bears the brunt here. Central Newfoundland, Western Newfoundland, pretty quiet for Saturday. Have a look at your temperatures and you can see we're looking at uh, yeah, near 18 to 20 degrees Central and Western Newfoundland on Saturday sun and cloud mix uh, for you folks in Labrador. And there is the setup in the east, which is clouds dominating, periods of rain at times heavy near 16 degrees. Saturday night through Sunday, more rain coming in. And in fact, uh, some of the forecast models showing some of those heavier rains for Saturday night in through Sunday. Northeasterly winds are going to keep temps cool. Fog patches likely in the mix as well, running you through Sunday afternoon. And you can still see where we're going to be watching this Basically, this frontal boundary is stalled overhead for Saturday, Sunday, and into Monday, and that's where we'll really rack up the rainfall. Sunday's forecast, I think we'll get clipped by a few showers in central, 
Western Newfoundland continues dry. Chance of a shower in Labrador. Quick look at the forecast model. This is the Euro model running you right through. Uh, by the time we get to Sunday, likely 20 to 50 millimeters. And then Sunday night through Monday, run this through again, another 20 to 50 millimeters. So by Monday night, from Friday through Monday night, we're talking upwards of 50 to 100 millimeters possible across the Avalon Peninsula, perhaps the Buren, Clarenville, and Bonavista. Quick look at that seven day trend. It's a soggy one here in the east. And yeah, uh, our driver, <laughs> Kirk, driver Kirk is literally jumping up and down. He's so happy. Of course, he's driving the Targa uh, over the next uh, week and he wants rain. He's getting it uh, here across central Newfoundland. Uh, again, you can see where things are starting to brighten up towards the end of the week. Labrador, uh, unfortunately, mid to late next week, starting to look a little unsettled uh, for you folks. Now, we met Kirk, the driver. Let's now meet Corey, the navigator, Corey Prosser. Uh, now, I love the story how uh, Kirk is from Ontario. You're from Newfoundland. Why don't you talk about how you guys came to race together over the next week? Uh, well, it started uh, about a year ago. Um, my past rider, Mike, uh, wanted to take a break. So I said, okay, well, I'll just take a break myself. And uh, Darren phoned me at like 7 or 8 in the evening and uh, said he has a driver for me and wants me and me only. And so you said yes immediately? Uh, well, I had to talk to him first. <laughs> we had to, uh, I had to see what he was like, you know, you can't just you know, go on a whim and say yes, so. Well, you're going to be driving at speeds of 200 kilometers per hour. You probably want to know who's behind the wheel. Yes. So uh, we had a chat about that and what his, uh, his past experiences was, and I said yes. Awesome. Now, uh, why don't you talk about what a navigator, what, what is your job in the car? Um, well, my role is basically to keep him and me safe on the road. Um, and to get the quickest times. So I have to have all my notes ready, have everything has to be intact. If not, it could be off the road. No pressure. No pressure. I've done it for three years. I can do it. Yeah. Uh, quickly, why don't you talk about, uh, you know, uh, Kirk was talking about the fact that you guys are racing for mental health. You're, you, you also have a special place in your heart for and who you're racing for over the next five days. Um, yep, I have people that I know of that are struggling with mental health. Um, a friend of ours that we lost last year due to mental health. So it's a really big initiative to get this out and try to get people aware that, you know, there is a problem and we need people to help. So if there's anyone that has any issues that are struggling to talk to somebody, we need help. So we need to help them. So that's, that's why we're doing it. Perfect. Well, I wish you guys all the luck. We're going to have one more uh, chat with you guys before uh, we leave. We'll get another look inside the car coming up. Uh, so stay with us here and uh, here and now continues. Okay, let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is Haley Barney from Happy Valley Goose Bay. Yeah, Haley is four years old and loves dancing, playing soccer and skating. That's a great job keeping active, Haley. You are our young athlete of the day. Nearly 500 students are going to pile into Eastside Elementary tomorrow morning. I'm Colleen Connors and I'll tell you why there's a new elementary school in Cornerbrook.
Welcome back to Here and Now. While most students are now into their first week of school, some young people in Cornerbrook are still waiting. That's because a brand new elementary school won't open until tomorrow. Well, today Here and Now's Colleen Connors got a sneak peek inside. In just a day, nearly 500 students will fill these hallways. 34 teachers from two closed schools are getting to know each other today before students arrive. Humber Elementary and St. Gerard's closed and almost all the teachers and students move in here to Eastside Elementary. Yeah, I'm uh, honored to be principal of the school. You know, I've been a principal for a long time and uh, this is a fantastic facility. It's now the largest K-6 school in the city. This building used to be a junior high school, so classrooms and even the bathrooms had to be upgraded to accommodate primary aged children. The gym has new floors and new lighting. Millions were spent on the upgrades. They have new desks, they have new shelves, new teacher's desks, uh, some new furniture in the library, and uh, uh, you know, and, and that's really cool. So they're walking into a new school with new furniture, some new faces, but a warm, friendly environment for all the children. Books and supplies are in place, but not all the construction will be finished by tomorrow. While the teachers and the principal seem more than ready for the nearly 500 students to pile in here tomorrow morning, some construction work still needs to continue, like the work you see on the bricks outside the building here. But all of that will be done after hours, after 3 o'clock, once the students are gone home. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Well, here's what Michael Roberts spotted yesterday as he was about to get out of his truck to go blueberry picking. Roberts says he was between Roberts Arm and Southbrook at Kippens Ridge, a popular cabin area. Yeah, it looks like that bear probably beat him to those blueberries. <laughs> it was about three meters from his truck and he didn't get out of his vehicle, but he says the bear didn't seem to be afraid at all. That's not necessarily a good thing, but <laughs> no. it was good he stayed in the truck. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone. As you've seen, Ryan's been handling weather duties from the road tonight, checking out at least one of the Targa cars in town for the annual racing competition. Yeah, that would have been a fun gig, getting to be out and about. <laughs> All right, uh, back out here outside and uh, talking with uh, Kirk Jones, the driver. Uh, Kirk, 
maybe just a, a quick word about how you've been preparing over the last few weeks and months to get ready for this race. Year, actually, of preparation. Um, well, uh, some quirky things uh, that I had some great coaching from uh, a fellow racer, Pierre Bork, uh, was getting on the time zone. So I've been running on Newfoundland time zone for the last two weeks. Um, uh, a lot of fit physical fitness. All my track days and practice days were always on a Friday when I was very tired. I'd make a point of being very exhausted before I got to the track and uh, then going out for the sessions and, and really focusing on being tired but being razor focused. Because you're going to be really tired uh, uh, day after day after day of driving. I, I, this is my first time and I've, I, the one thing you, you learn is you listen to those who have gone before you. And, and they can off, the, the people have been great. Target Newfoundland have been great. Uh, the race, you know, the participants have been really good. Um, but listen to what they had to say. And they said, by the time you get rolled around on Thursday and Friday, you will be exhausted. So you need to be able to be in that frame of mind or that exhausted state and m keep your mental sharpness. Um, which, you know, keeping your brain ready for this race, perfect segue to why yep. you guys are in the race again. Well, it's, it really is about creating awareness. When it comes right down to it, it's all about creating awareness. And, uh, you know, we've got a, we've got a web page and, you know, you can make donations and we're going to... We're, give that a shout out? Yeah, we're giving a... a we're, you know, there's four benefactors thrive here locally in, uh, in St. John's and we've got a couple back in Ontario. Um, but it's, it's my own register. I went through the effort of making a, our own registered charity and we're, we're going to feed, uh, feed into the, the, the mental health. Target Newfoundland and your website? Nobrainer.ca. Nobrainer.ca. And uh, great, good luck on the race uh, with the race this week, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to the folks in Newfoundland, too, for allowing us to do this. Nice. Like, seriously. <laughs> Well, and just a reminder, if you tuned in late or you missed something and you want to see it again, the entire show online, cbc.ca slash nl. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great night, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Good night, and enjoy the beautiful weather while it lasts. <laughs>